Part One of Cecil's Own Book by Anne Hawkshaw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cecil's Own Book by Granny, Mrs. Hawkshaw. Printed for private circulation, 1871. To the memory of Mary, mother of Cecil. The Wonderful Adventures of Hassan the Younger, the son of Hassan al Alfi, the camel driver. When the Caliph Omar reigned in Baghdad, there lived by the wells of Musa a certain camel driver called Hassan al Alfi, who had seven sons, and the youngest was named Hassan the Little, or Hassan the Younger, to distinguish him from his father. The six elder sons went long journeys with their father across the desert but the little hassan went not but remained at home with an old woman who had been his nurse and he played in the garden by the fountains and amused himself on the seashore gathering shells of which there were many of strange shapes and of most beautiful colours one day when his father and brothers were absent the old woman said to hassan i must go away for two days to buy some clothes of which i am in need go not away to the seashore but stay in the house and the garden, for it may happen that thy father and thy brothers may return in my absence, and if they come back and found no one to prepare them food, they would be greatly displeased. So Hassan promised the old woman he would remain in the garden till she returned. So she departed, taking a bottle of water to drink and some dates to eat on her journey and Hassan sat down under the tall palm trees by the side of the large fountain to read in the Koran, for his father would not allow his sons to remain ignorant of the arts of reading and writing. When he had finished reading, he looked up, and to his great astonishment he saw an old man standing by the fountain, for he had heard no one come up to the garden. The old man had a long white beard that reached down to his girdle, his dress was a long linen tunic fastened with a leather belt from which hung a small red earthen dish like a little shallow basin he had in one hand a bottle made of the same sort of red earth and in the other a long bamboo stick on which he leaned heavily as if he had walked long in the desert and was weary now hassan knew at once that he was a holy man who had been a pilgrimage to the tomb of the prophets and he laid aside his book and rose up from under the trees where he had been sitting and saluted the old man by bowing down with his face to the ground and said my father will you drink of the waters of musa and repose under the aged palm trees where our great ancestor ishmael hath sat and the old man replied i will my son then hassan spread a mat under the tree and fetched water from the well and hastened and put dates and oranges and custard apples in a basket made of palm leaf and strewed sweet scented henna flowers over them and when he had brought them to the pilgrim he said eat my father and leave a blessing on the house of hassan el alfi even the blessing of one who hath prayed at the tomb of the prophet praised be allah for so he had been taught by his father to welcome all holy men when they came to drink at the wells of the desert so the old man ate and drank and lay down and slept under the cool shade of the palm trees overcome by the fatigue of his long journey and by the heat of the day for the sky was without a cloud and of the colour of burnished copper and the fierce heat of the sun was like the heat of a great oven and the long leaves of the palm trees moved not for there was not a breath of air to stir them and the sweet scented flowers drooped as if they were dying and the bundles of hay ready for the camels when they came home were dry as the shavings of wood and the sand of the desert that surrounded the gardens and the wells glistened and shone in the glare of that terrible noonday heat even the lizards clung to the mud walls silent and sleepy and did not run nimbly about and in and out of the cracks as if they were playing at hide and seek with one another as is the wont of lizards to do there was not a sound of man or beast or bird or insect wind or water 
for the silence was complete all things seemed burnt to brick and baked into hardness and hassan as well as the old man overpowered by the heat slept till the sun began to go down in the west and a breeze began to stir the branches of the trees and the flowers revived in the pleasant coolness then hassan awoke and looked to see if the pilgrim was sleeping but lo he was gone but on the mat where he had slept were two leather bags tied with strings then hassan got up with haste and ran round the garden and looked in the garden house built by the great fountain but he could not find the old man then he climbed to the top of a tall tree from which he could see for miles into the desert but he saw nothing but a great dust which he knew must be caused by a troop of camels and he rejoiced at the sight and his heart was glad for he thought it must be his father and brothers who were coming home so he came down quickly and prepared the hay for the camels to eat and water for them to drink and spread a mat for his father and got ready food for supper and when all things were in a state of readiness he remembered the bags that the old man had left and opened one to see what was in it and when he had looked into it he was amazed for it was full of pieces of gold then he opened the other and behold it was full of diamonds and rubies and emeralds then hassan clapped his hands and danced round the bags with delight and cried i will go to baghdad and live as doth the weezer of the caliph and wear a robe of silk and drink sherbet out of a golden cup then he took out some of the diamonds and rubies and emeralds and admired greatly their beautiful colours and held up the diamonds to the light to see how they glittered and whilst he was searching amongst them he saw there was a piece of paper with some words written thereon and looking with attention he perceived that it was addressed unto himself for on the outside was written in beautiful arabic writing to hassan the little the son of hassan al alfi then he unrolled the paper and then he saw that there was more writing inside and he composed himself attentively to read and the words were as follows the blessing of the old man even the aged pilgrim from mecca who was wearied with journeying and fainting for lack of bread and of water and who drank of the wells of musa and eat of the fresh dates of the garden and slept safely under the palm trees in the hot noontide rest on the house of hassan el alfi and a double blessing rest on the head of hassan the little for he reverenced the aged man even the aged pilgrim from mecca and made obeisance unto him and tended him like a son now the old man believing that the boy hassan is one in whose heart dwelleth truth leaveth in his care two leather bags filled with precious treasure until he cometh again to claim them and at the time appointed by allah he will come again and ask of hassan the little to deliver up the gold and the gems he also giveth to hassan a ring that is sewed up in a small bag of silk of damascus which is concealed at the bottom of the bag of gold praised be allah now when hassan had read these words he emptied the bag of gold on to the mat and found at the bottom a small silken bag such as the writing had described and it was carefully sewed up then he took from his belt a knife and cut the stitches and there appeared at the bottom of the bag a ring then hassan took out the ring and behold it was but a ring of copper and he threw it down on the ground and said it is but a ring of copper such as the very water carriers of cairo would not gather out of the dust and when he looked at the gold and the precious stones he despised the copper ring and left it lying on the ground and sat silent and sad now near him was a henna tree covered with white sweet scented blossoms and a bird of dull plumage that had no beauty came and perched upon the branches and began to sing and it sang these words to the great astonishment of hassan as he sat with all the treasure of the sacks poured out around him 
and the ring thrown down on the mat look not upon the treasure hassan hide it quickly from thy sight watch me as i float away far above these realms of night homeliest things are not the meanest and the dull can change to bright watch me as i float away to the skies of pearly light after that the bird with the dusky wings flew away and as it flew far away it seemed to hassan no more a bird but a peri with wings of gold and asia then hassan arose before the words of the wonderful creature had escaped his memory and gathered all the gold and the precious stones and put them into the bags and tied them with the strings and sat down on the mat but he was sad and sighed frequently and said of what use is all this treasure to an old man whose time on this earth will be short and whose days are spent in pilgrimage to the holy places and in ceaseless prayers to allah and the bread and water sufficeth for food i will take the bags and hide them in the earth and when some weeks have passed by and my father and my brothers are about again to depart i will secrete some of the treasure in my belt and i will go with them and when i reach some great city i will leave my father and my brothers and will sell the precious stones and buy silk robes and a palace like the palace of the weezer and no one will know and when i want more money i will return hither secretly and take more of the treasure and he rose and prepared to carry away the bags and hide them but again he heard words come from the henna tree and he stopped and beheld and there sat a bird of the most brilliant plumage in the branches its wings glittered like the jewels in the turban of the caliph and hassan was astonished at its great beauty and it said take the treasure take it hassan it will make thee rich and great there is no one here to see thee i will not the deed relate am i not of wondrous beauty wouldst thou like to share my fate take the treasure seize it quickly and for ever be my mate then hassan began to dig a hole to bury the bags and while he did so he thought he heard a laugh of derision from the glittering creature and he was afraid and trembled exceedingly for he knew he was doing an evil deed in taking the treasure of the old man to be his own now it was the hour of sunset and he remembered he had not washed so he put down the bags and washed in the well and spread his carpet and knelt down to pray with his face towards mecca and as he prayed the bird changed its form and became a loathsome creature with wings like a bat and long sharp claws on its feet and round staring eyes that were like sparks of fire that scorched hassan as he looked at it and its voice became like the voice of the cruel hyena of the desert and hassan was terrified beyond measure and he said i will not take the treasure of the old man i will only take the ring that he gave me and the blessing he inscribed on the paper will rest on me and on the house of my father and he sought for the ring and put it on the forefinger of his right hand and when he did so the ugly creature gave a loud scream and flew away and hassan shuddered with exceeding fear then he took the bags into the garden house and sat down to wait till his father and brothers should arrive and his heart was at peace and now outside the hedge of the garden he heard the loud voices of men and the voices were not the voices of his brothers but those of strangers and their words were violent and they uttered not the name of allah and hassan was afraid and he sat still on the mat and trembled then six men entered the garden and took the hay and the water that hassan had prepared for his father's camels and gave them to their own camels and when they had taken the loads off the beasts they left them fastened to a palm tree outside the garden and came themselves to the place where hassan sat now they were fierce robbers from the desert who feared not allah and had no pity on any living thing when they saw hassan they said 
oh here is a slave who will procure us food and water for doubtless he hath them by him for is not this the house and garden of hassan el alfi the rich camel driver whom we robbed on the way to baghdad then he who was the chief said to hassan the little rise and bring us quickly some food and water and spread mats under the trees for we will rest and eat in this place and afterwards thou shalt go with us and be our slave and attend to the camels then poor hassan the little rose trembling and went to fetch water and food and he wept and said alas alas i shall see my father and my brothers no more but must be a slave to the robbers of the desert and he wrung his hands and wept bitterly but the men had no pity on him but said if thou makest not haste o slave we will beat thee as the carpets are beaten in the palace of the caliph now one of the robbers went into the garden house to see if there he could find clothes or money to carry away and as he was searching he espied the two bags that hassan had put on the divan and he took them and carried them to the other robbers under the palm trees and they said oh what have we here what hath this boy hidden in these leather bags that are so carefully tied up and when they had opened them and saw the treasure they rejoiced excessively and said this exceedeth all the treasure we have taken from the caravans this year then the sheikh said tie up the bags and to-morrow when we rest at noon i will divide the gold and the precious stones to each his right proportion but the boy i will keep to be my slave when hassan heard these words he fell on his face and entreated them not to carry him away nor to take the bags and he told them the whole story about the old man and he showed them the writing to prove that he spoke words of truth and they read the paper and saw that it was as he had said then they laughed and mocked at hassan and said let us look at this ring and when they saw it they laughed yet the louder and the sheikh said thou mayest keep thy copper ring for it is fit only for the finger of a slave but we will have the bags and i will keep the writing for it may be a charm of great value as is the writing of a dervish and when hassan entreated them to have pity on him they beat him with a bamboo cane put him into the garden house and fastened the door and he wept all night and could not sleep and continually lamented and said oh my father oh my brothers and as he sat weeping and lamenting behold the ring came off his finger and it rolled along the floor and as it rolled it grew bigger and brighter till it shone like molten iron and grew yet larger and larger and then it fell over and hassan was sitting in the centre of the great circle that it made and it appeared like fire all around him but it scorched him not and outside the circle of fire he saw the vile creature that tempted him to take the bags and also evil genie and ugly crawling creatures and loathsome animals that tried to get at him but they could not because of the wonderful belt of flame that surrounded him so after a time they fled away and when they were gone the ring shrunk again to its former size and appeared but as a ring of copper and hassan took it up and put it on his finger and said doubtless this ring hath wonderful properties and is a talisman of great value praised be allah and he rejoiced that the robbers had despised it and that they had left it with him and after that his heart was less sorrowful and he slept and was refreshed now early in the morning the robbers unfastened the door of the garden house and called to hassan to come out and to load the camels and when all was ready they took the two bags of treasure and departed the sheikh rode on a fleet dromedary and he made hassan lead the camels that were laden with water for they had filled all their water skins with the sweet water from the wells of musa for they were going many days journey into the desert where they would find no water nor grass nor herbs save the bitter herbs of the wilderness that no man can eat 
they took the way to the red sea and at noon they stopped to shelter from the extreme heat of the sun under a great rock and the camels lay down to rest then the sheikh said bring the sacks and i will divide the gold and the precious stones and hassan was compelled to bring them and they opened first the sack that contained the gold and lo instead of gold it was filled with sand then they opened the other that contained the diamonds and the emeralds and the rubies and lo they had been changed into little white and coloured pebbles such as are on the seashore then the sheikh said it is thou that hast done this o oh, hassan the little thou shalt die thou deceitful and wicked slave if thou dost not immediately reveal where thou hast hidden the treasure that was in these sacks yesterday then hassan replied o oh, my master i know not how this hath taken place i am ignorant of what hath become of the treasure but they would not believe him and were exasperated beyond measure because the treasure was gone so they took up hassan and threw him into the sea and he sank out of their sight in the clear water and they left the bags under the rock and departed on their journey now hassan at the first when he was thrown into the sea was stunned and his mind was confused with fear but after a while he found to his great joy and extreme wonder that he could live in the water as well as on the land and he went down to the bottom of the sea and it was as a lovely garden the corals and the sea plants amongst which the shining little fishes swam or rested were beautiful to his sight and the coolness of the water was refreshing to his heated limbs and he said praised be allah who hath bestowed on me this wonderful ring for it is no doubt by its power that i have been preserved and that i can live at the bottom of the sea i will sit a while on this ledge of rock that looks like a couch with a carpet of ispahan spread over it for this sea moss is beautiful as embroidered work from the looms of iran and i will watch the strange creatures of the sea as they swim about me so he sat down on the rock and the water was like a vault of emerald above him and he saw the oysters opening and shutting their shells and he saw the pearls glistening within them and he watched the sea hedgehogs moving about and he gathered shells of great beauty such he had never found on the shore whose colours were like the colours of the rainbow in which one colour mingles with another and hassan said to himself this place is lovely as the gardens of damascus of which my father hath told me then he found a large shell that resembled a trumpet and he put it to his mouth and blew into it and it produced a sound like that of a silver trumpet and he amused himself with blowing into it but after he had amused himself so for some time he heard a similar sound proceeding from a distance and the sound came nearer and nearer and he beheld a troop of creatures coming towards him their faces were beautiful as the moon and their eyes lovely as the eyes of the gazelles in the desert and their arms were fair as alabaster but from their waists they resembled fishes now they were the sons and daughters of the old merman who lived in the cavern underneath the rock on which hassan was sitting they had heard the sound of the trumpet shell that he had been playing upon and had come up to see who it was that had taken one of their instruments of music it may be hassan heard them say as they came on one of our cousins from iran who hath brought us the large pearls that our uncle promised us so long ago or perchance it is a messenger from the sea king to inquire after the health of our father for he is now the oldest and most venerated of all the sons of the sea but when they saw hassan they were overcome with astonishment and wonder and were silent from amazement after a while they recovered from their great surprise and swam close up to him and one of them said this is one of the strange creatures who live on the land to whom allah hath not granted a tail but who move about on two pegs and they began to laugh immoderately and they said let us take the tailless creature to our father 
it will amuse him greatly to see him then one of them said to hassan canst thou speak o oh, thou tailless creature or art thou dumb like the fishes what is thy name then hassan said i am called hassan the little and the name of my father is hassan al alfi the camel driver and because of a charm i have about me i can live in the water and i will go with you for though you are but sea monsters and i am of the superior race of men i think you are kind in heart and will not hurt me then they said no we will not hurt thee but they laughed excessively when they heard him call them sea monsters and said this poor creature from the land hath not much intelligence for he thinketh he is greater and wiser than the mermen who have tails covered with shining scales of gold and green and asia but allah hath not granted to all creatures the same amount of sense so we will have pity on him when they saw hassan stand on his two legs they laughed again and said do all the creatures on the land move as thou doest on two pegs and hassan answered no some of them go on four and they laughed again more immoderately and said certainly the old man of the sea who composeth the songs and the histories never imagined any creatures so strange as these of whom this mortal speaketh and he hath lived for a thousand years and is the most learned of all the children of the sea we think in this matter thou tellest not the truth o hassan the little but now we will go to our father the old man of the sea then hassan floated with them through the clear water till they came to a cavern and they swam into it and hassan was oppressed and bewildered with the extreme beauty of the place when he examined it there were on each hand a thousand pillars of emerald that supported the roof that was inlaid with the scales of gold and silver fishes curiously wrought together and between each pillar was suspended a globe of pure white crystal filled with the phosphorescence of the sea which gave light to the hall of the thousand pillars the floor was of pale pink coral of the most delicate colour and the divan was formed of mother of pearl and on it reclined at the upper end of the hall the wise old man of the sea then the mermen and mermaidens brought hassan to him and said oh our father we have found this strange creature of the land and have brought him that thou mayest amuse thyself with him and he shall tell us his history though he is not beautiful to behold and seemeth to lack intelligence then the old merman regarded hassan and said tell us thy story and after i have heard thee speak i can judge of thy sense and hassan told them all his history he disguised nothing and when he had finished the old merman said i am the oldest son of the sea yet i cannot decide whether the things thou tellest o son of the land are truth or falsehood i will consider the matter for a whole moon and thou shalt dwell here with my sons and my daughters and no one shall say that thou art a liar or shall mock thee and his children were abashed before him for they knew he was wise with the wisdom of many years and they were very young yet had they given an opinion immediately they had seen hassan that he was a creature of little sense and spoke falsehoods but their father had decided he must consider the subject for one whole moon and they said one to another we will not laugh any more at the tailless creature but will call him hassan as he saith that is his name so they were kind to him and his heart was at peace and they showed him every day some new plant or new creature of the sea and he was every day more astonished at the wonderful things he saw and when a moon was nearly past hassan said to one of the maidens of the sea who was the most loved of them all i wonder not o oh, dear maiden of the sea that thy brothers believed in their hearts that i spoke falsehoods when i told them of the strange creatures of the land for if any one had informed me when i dwelt by the wells of musa 
of the strange things that i see here day by day i should have said that they spoke not the truth i perceive that it becometh the young and the ignorant to be silent and to learn now at the end of a full moon the old merman of the hall of the thousand pillars sent for hassan and said to him o son of the land i have pondered over thy words and have observed thy deeds for one whole moon and i am convinced that thou speakest the truth so dwell with us as long as thou art content to do so and tell us of the strange adventures that have come to thy knowledge respecting the children of the land so hassan was glad that his words were believed and he told them of his home by the wells of musa and of the beautiful things he had heard described by his friends who had visited strange countries and when he had finished some of the children of the sea sighed and said it were better to live on the land than in the sea but the old wise man said allah whose name be praised hath appointed to all creatures the lot that is best for them and a change will come for you o oh, you children of the sea then the sea maiden who was the best beloved said yes o oh, my father we shall assuredly go to the isle of the sweet fountains when the time that allah hath appointed shall come now it came to pass that in seven days the dear maiden of the sea who was the most beloved died and they all lamented for her bitterly and hassan also though he was not of their race nor of their kindred wept for the loss of the maiden of the pure and loving heart and the hall of the thousand pillars became sad to him and he wandered from it until he lost all means of finding his way back again and he floated into the deep ocean and sank deeper and deeper into its silent and measureless abysses and he became afraid as he went downward and downward into its silent depths for as he descended lower and lower all the beautiful things he had seen in the hall of the merman disappeared and the silence and the solitude became insupportable to hassan and his heart became as a stone within him as he sank deeper and deeper and he said perchance it is ordained that i am to live for ever amid these silent waters oh would that i had died like the dear maiden of the sea but his lamenting was of no avail for he sank yet deeper and deeper till at last his feet rested on a vast mountain that rose from the bottom of the nethermost ocean and he was glad even of that change though the mountain was full of deep pits and horrible caverns and he would have rejoiced at the sight of the smallest fish or of a piece of seaweed clinging to the rocks but there was no living thing to be seen but he said perchance in that immense cavern that i see in the side of the mountain there may dwell some kind creatures of the race of the merman who will direct me how to find my way to the land for i wish now to return to my father's house so he descended and looked into the cavern and he could not move from the spot but stood like one entranced and his eyes were dilated with astonishment and wonder and fear he saw that the cavern was of great extent and was supported on pillars of adamant and the floor and the roof were of marble black as the night sky when no stars shine in it to each pillar was a ring and an iron chain at the further end of the cave was a door of open iron curiously wrought with figures of a serpent with a crown of gold and of carbuncles on his head and through the open work of the door he saw another cave more wonderful than the first for in the middle was a fountain of fire and the flames kept shooting upward and then falling down again like streams of liquid amber and by the light of the fire fountain hassan saw reclining on a divan of black stone the great sea serpent king and he knew who he was because the wise old man of the sea had spoken of him but always with abhorrence because he did evil to the mermen and enchanted them and they avoided him and feared him greatly hassan could not see his great length 
but he was coiled round and round till he formed as many circles as sailors make of a thousand fathoms of cordage but he saw that he had on his head a great crown of gold and had round his neck a collar of carbuncles the size of ostrich eggs and they glimmered and shone in the light of the fountain of fire when hassan had observed all these things he said this is a vile place and this is an evil disposed creature i will not tarry any longer near him though i perceive that he is asleep now but if he wakes he may entrance me and turn me into a pillar of adamant for now i see that all the pillars in this cave are in the likeness of living things of the sea or of the land and doubtless by his magic he hath entranced them so hassan turned and fled quickly now as he was passing out he saw that there were two strange sea monsters chained by their necks to the two pillars nearest the entrance and as he looked on them he saw that they were weeping and they opened their mouths as if they would fain speak to him but they could not utter a sound but they continued to gaze at him with eyes full of tears now hassan was compassionate and he said who are ye but they only looked the more sorrowfully and beseechingly at him but could not utter a word then hassan perceived that they were dumb but that they were not without intelligence and he said i will at the least unchain them and perchance they will find by the mercy of allah some way out of their enchantment so he went to the one on the right hand and undid his chain and while he did so he touched the strange creature with his ring and lo it was changed immediately into a young merman then hassan was glad and unfastened the one on the left hand and touched it also with his ring and lo it became a beautiful maiden of the sea and they said o oh, beneficent one let us hasten away from this abominable cave praised be allah who hath had pity on us and sent thee to deliver us for we have been enchanted for many years and hope of deliverance had died in our hearts so they and hassan went out of the cave and began to float upward through the waters but they grew weary and decided to rest so they reposed on a ledge of the great mountain at the foot of which was the hall of adamant and while they reclined on the rock hassan said tell me your adventure o ye children of the sea and by what misfortune ye became enchanted and they replied to him o oh, good creature of the land we are of the children of the sea who dwell in the gulf of oran and our home is in the palace of pearl for it is built of mother of pearl that glistens in the clear waters with the colours of the rainbow and it is surrounded by a grove of pink coral beautiful to behold now it happened by the disposal of allah whose name be praised that our father said take these pearls to our cousins the children of the old man of the sea who dwelleth in the hall of the thousand pillars then hassan interrupted them and said my heart is glad and i rejoice greatly that i have delivered you from your enchantment in the hall of the serpent king for you are the relations of those whom i respect greatly and with whom i have dwelt more than one whole moon but proceed with your adventures for i would fain hear them to the conclusion o oh, benevolent stranger they said we took the pearls from our father and we replied o oh, father to hear is to obey but when we had left him and were swimming on to the hall of the thousand pillars we said to each other what use is it to go directly to the old man of the sea let us amuse ourselves by going downwards to see what things and creatures are in the abysses of the great ocean for doubtless they are many and wonderful to behold but alas after a time we lost all power over our motions and were drawn down rapidly with great force till we reached the hall of adamant and were drawn by enchantment into it and up to the place where reclined the serpent king of the sea and he hissed at us and said o oh, disobedient children of the sea ye are in my power now and i will enchant you 
and ye shall lose all that is beautiful about you and become monsters then we feared greatly and wept but he only laughed and hissed at us and he looked at us with his red fiery eyes we felt ourselves changed into the ugly creatures thou sawest o oh, good stranger and then he chained us to the pillars at the entrance of the cave and the power of speech was taken from us we could only weep and lament our fate in our hearts for it was not in the power of the evil serpent king to change our minds and though we could not utter words we could pray to allah in our thoughts and entreat him to have compassion on us but our hearts grew every moon more sorrowful and we despaired of deliverance when thou camest and released us o oh, beneficent stranger wilt thou tell us thy name that we may retain it for ever in our memories and inscribe it on the most honourable place of the palace of pearl and he said my name is hassan the little the son of hassan el alfi the camel driver of the wells of musa and they replied to him during the whole of our existence we will not forget thee o hassan for the ungrateful are an abomination to allah then they proceeded upwards and at last the children of the sea uttered a cry of joy and said we know that we are not far from our home for these rocks are familiar to us and they parted from hassan with many kind words and thanks and he continued his way towards the shores of arabia it was at the time of sunset when he came to the top of the sea and he saw at a little distance from him an island beautiful as the gardens of paradise at first he thought it was only the reflection of the gold and purple and rose colours of the sky which made the appearance of a glorious island of light in the clear waters of the sea but as he considered it with attention he became convinced that it was the island of the sweet fountains that the dear maiden of the sea loved to converse about and he said i will go and examine more nearly the island of beauty and loveliness that allah hath placed in the sea and he drew near and landed in a garden where all the flowers of the world were blooming and where the sound of fountains that fell into marble basins curiously carved and the murmuring of running streams were heard perpetually and hassan's heart was dilated with joy at the sight of the garden and he said i will repose here one night before i proceed to my father's house i am astonished that i never heard from any of the dwellers by the wells of musa of this beautiful island for it seemeth to me very nigh to the land of the sons of ishmael and it was even so for to the generality of persons it only appeared as the colours of the sunset and they passed it by with indifference so hassan wandered about the garden and drank from the fountains and lay down to sleep and when he awoke from a sweet and refreshing slumber the full moon was shining and he looked up and lo beside him stood a beautiful creature of the children of the genie her eyes were like the eyes of the gazelle of the desert and her form was like the palm tree in its beauty and grace and hassan arose and bowed with his face to the ground and made obeisance for he was overwhelmed with astonishment and wonder and reverence then he heard a voice sweet as the wind of the south through the curves of a sea-shell that said hassan son of hassan el alfi dost thou not know me and he gazed on the beautiful genie and he knew in his heart that it was the dear maiden of the sea whom he had loved so much when he lived in the hall of the thousand pillars now she was changed into wondrous beauty and loveliness but it was only the change from the seed to the full-grown flower so hassan knew her to be the same dear maiden who had been so kind to him before she was changed and became one of the genii of the island of sweet fountains and his heart was filled with joy that found no words to express itself so he only gazed at her with pleasure in his eyes and with his hands clasped in reverence 
for he felt he was in the presence of a being greatly superior to himself and he remembered with shame how often he had despised the discourse he had heard from her of the things that would be in the island of the sweet fountains to which she always said she should go after her life as a maiden of the sea had finished for the words had seemed to him but as fables now he bowed before her and was silent then she smiled on him and said softly i know what thou hast done for the disobedient children of the sea whom thou hast released from a long enchantment the blessing of allah whose name be praised beyond thee hassan and now thou must return to thy father's house and perform all the duties that pertain to thy station as the son of the good camel driver hassan al alfi whose misfortunes have been many and grievous and when thy task is completed thou wilt see me again then hassan found words to speak and said o oh, beautiful daughter of the genie cannot i benefit thee in some measure can i not go to the hall of the thousand pillars and bring thee tokens of the welfare of thy father and of those whom thou lovest then replied the lovely child of the genie with a smile that made the heart happy as a ray of sunshine maketh gladsome a dark cavern it is good that thou hast thought of this o hassan but i need it not every day i see them and know of their welfare for when the last ray of the sun toucheth the sea i go down upon it and visit my kindred they are not aware of my presence for so allah hath decreed except that they feel in their hearts an ineffable calm for which they can assign no reason and i shall watch over them till the time that is fixed shall come and they too shall join me in the island of the sweet fountains and the time will not be long when she ceased speaking hassan felt a wonderful drowsiness come over him and he fell into a deep sleep how long he slept he never could discover but when he awoke it was noonday and he was laid under the rocks where the robbers had examined the sacks and found them full of stones and sand and where they had determined to throw hassan into the sea and now when he had opened his eyes behold he saw the two sacks beside him and he was overwhelmed with astonishment and said the beautiful child of the genie hath conveyed me hither during the night now i will return immediately as she desired me to do unto the wells of musa and serve and comfort my father and he prepared to depart when lo he saw before him the aged pilgrim who had given him the ring and the bags so he bowed to the ground and said i have nothing to offer thee holy dervish not even a cup of water for my adventures have been strange since i entertained thee at my father's house and i am straitened in my heart because i have not fulfilled the trust thou gavest to me here are the bags committed to my keeping but they are filled with sand and pebbles then the old man touched the bags with his staff and said open the bags o hassan the little and let us see the change that has befallen the treasure so hassan opened them and they were filled with gold and diamonds and rubies and emeralds as before and he was silent with wonder and joy then he said i restore to thee o holy pilgrim that thou leftest with me and i thank thee above all for this wonderful talisman that thou gavest me which has been the means of teaching me many things i should not have discovered without it then the dervish said i give thee the sacks of treasure but thou must give me the ring for i need it to give to others of thy age who require to be taught as thou hast been so hassan took the copper ring from his finger and gave it to the dervish and he blessed him and departed and hassan saw him no more then hassan took a few pieces of gold from one of the sacks and put them in his sash and he hid the bags of treasure in a hole in the rocks and departed to the house of his father and the way was toilsome over the hot sand of the desert and when he arrived he found no one there 
and the garden was overrun with weeds and the channels for the water round the garden of herbs was dry for no one had replenished them from the well since he had been taken away by the robbers and the fence was broken down and the ripe dates were dropping from the trees for there was no one to gather them the only thing that remained unchanged was the great well for the water still bubbled up in it and ran over the side of the basin into a little canal it had made for itself and along the side of this channel the flowers and the trees were green and beautiful so hassan drank of the water and did eat of the fruit and was refreshed and lay down to rest in the garden house now hassan arose as soon as it was day and began to draw water and pour it into the channels to refresh the trees and the herbs and while he was at work a family came by of poor arabs who had been robbed of all they possessed by the bedouins of the desert and the father and his three sons asked charity of hassan in the name of allah and he gave them some more dates to eat and gave them water from the well and then he said be content to abide here and to assist me to restore the garden to its former state of usefulness and beauty and i will pay you with liberality for your work for i am desirous to have it in order before the return of my father who hath long been absent and i too though i am so young have had strange adventures and have been far away from this place where i was born perchance some day if ye consent to dwell with me i may tell you of the wonderful events that have occurred to me then the men rejoiced and said we will stay and work for thee o master and thou shalt pay us for our labour then the work of restoring all things to perfection proceeded rapidly and after a while hassan went to the place where he had hid the sacks and took out more gold and bought camels and sheep and carpets to cover the divans and made all ready to receive his father and his brothers but they came not neither had he any tidings of them and he went out and sat down in the desert and wept and said alas my father alas my brothers and as he sat and lamented there came to him a poor man whose robe was torn and tattered and whose face betokened hunger and sickness but he no sooner saw hassan than he cried out oh hassan my son and he embraced him and they wept for joy for it was hassan el alfi the father of hassan the little then he reverently led his father home and brought him water to wash and took off his soiled robe and put on him one of silk and made him recline on the divan and the servants came and served him with food and sherbet when he was refreshed hassan inquired respecting the welfare of his brothers and his father answered alas my son we have been robbed of all we possessed and thy brothers were compelled to hire themselves as servants to a rich merchant of baghdad but i was too old to work so they gave me some water and food for my journey and i have with great toil and labour travelled home and i am greatly astonished at all the abundance and beauty that i see around me and i know not from whence it hath come then hassan the younger told his father of all his strange adventures and the night was far advanced before he had narrated them all then they praised Allah and lay down to sleep. On the morrow, Hassan sent two of the servants with camels and gold and jewels to Baghdad for his brothers, that they might be relieved from their servitude. And at the end of two moons they returned, and there was rejoicing in the house of Hassan al Alfi such as had not been remembered by any man that dwelt by the wells of musa end of part one part two of cecil's own book by anne hawkshaw 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Selfish Toad There was once an old toad lived under a stone. He had lived there for years, all alone, all alone. Sometimes he went out to look for a dinner. He knew when the time came because he was thinner. So when he had eaten a few worms and snails, he quickly munched them up, heads, bodies and tails. He slowly crawled back to his home by the stone and said, It is pleasant to live here alone. I've no one to tease me and no one to feed. To live all for oneself is a very good creed. There's that drudge of a field mouse with six babies to keep. I wonder if ever she gets a night's sleep. I wish that their house was away from my door. They're squeaking for breakfast when I want to snore. And there are the bees, the ridiculous things, always working and buzzing and shaking their wings. I have got an attack of the nerves with their humming. It's almost as bad as the woodpecker's drumming. All around me is ever this worry and din. Then I live in a fright that my floor will fall in. For Engineer Mole, with his sharp scratching claws, is making a tunnel right under my paws. Just then a small voice from underground said, Good morrow, old grumbler. I'm under your bed. When you miscall your neighbours, so loudly don't speak. I have very good hearing, though my sight's rather weak. He had scarcely done talking when down from the hill came sliding some gravel, and when it stood still, it had filled up the doorway of Mr. Toad's house and fastened him in as a trap holds a mouse. He panted and struggled and thought he must die when up came the mole at his piteous cry. Oh, dear Mr. Mole, said the toad with a groan, can you tunnel away from under this stone? Oh, ow, oh, ow, oh, said the mole, you are growing polite when you want me to help you here out of your fright. I've heard that your people can live in a stone. You would like that, no doubt. You like living alone. Oh, dear Mr. Mole, don't stand talking, but try to make a hole out, or I surely shall die. Well, well, said the Mole, I will do what I can, and to scratch your way out, in right earnest began, and after a great deal of panting and puffing and squeezing and groaning and sighing and huffing, the toad made his way through the dark narrow hole, and waving his paw said oh dear mr mole you're the cleverest and kindest of creatures i know i wish i had more than mere thanks to bestow but one thing i've learnt it's a good thing to work and never a neighbourly action to shirk and the field mice may squeak and the bees they may hum and you may make tunnels and i will be dumb THE DISCONTENTED STREAM Far away, amid the mountains, underneath an aged thorn, mid a tuft of emerald greenness, once a tiny stream was born. With no noise it bubbled upward, then it gently slid away, hollowing out its rocky channel through long ages day by day. Sometimes round the stones it fretted, turning, twisting here and there, sometimes over pebbles rippling making them as jewels fair then again twas almost hidden by the heather and the fern and the shy birds of the moorland drank from out the tiny burn wider grown through fields it wandered and beside its grassy edge the reed warblers built their nests among the bulrush and the sedge underneath moss-covered bridges past the village and the farm still it hurried onward onward never resting never calm from its home amid the mountains underneath the old thorn tree through the moorland and the meadow on it went to find the sea thus for ages long long ages 
it had wandered on its way when one hot and sultry summer the reed warblers heard it say ever flowing ever flowing to the wild and solemn sea am i never to be tranquil all things seem to rest but me i am weary of this movement of this never-ceasing flow i should like to stop and listen or watch the flowers and rushes grow then a voice came murmuring softly from the willow overhead think not of thy pleasure streamlet thus the bending branches said thou wert made for ceaseless motion ever to the sea to tend i was made nor murmur at it all my life o'er thee to bend but the stream still murmured sadly would oh would that i might rest to lie stagnant dull and weedy streamlet would not make thee blest said the yellow glow flowers to it as it hurried murmuring past but the day so longed for hoped for to the streamlet came at last it was turned into a hollow banked and hidden from the view and no more the waving willow or the wild flowers near it grew it was still and black and silent slimy weeds upon it spread loathsome newts and tadpoles filled it but fair creatures from it fled wicked jack-o'-lanterns loved it and on dark and misty nights danced and gambled round and o'er it with their false and flitting lights and if poor benighted wanderers thinking it was cottage fire trusting followed the bad elfins they were lost amid the mire noisome vapours o'er it hovered and men shunned the doleful spot thus was lost the mountain streamlet that had murmured at its lot End of part two. Part three of Cecil's own book by Anne Hawkshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Little Prince be petted by all. Once upon a time there lived a little boy who was called Prince be petted by all. His house was in one of the fairy lands for you must know that there are a great many fairy lands besides that you read of in the dear old books that children love so much all except those very dull boys and girls who can only read the very biggest fact print and can never look inside anything oh yes there is the fairy land of the dear old books where the trees are made of emeralds and the apples are gold and where the lady fairies sleep on rose leaves and the baby fairies swing in hammocks of gossamer and the fairy soldiers have arms of thistledown and ride on dragonflies when they go to battle then there is the fairyland of the brave-hearted northmen where the palaces are built of glittering icebergs and the little gnomes dig and hammer in the mines of silver and gold and laugh and grin at any unlucky mortal who has strayed into their caverns and threaten to pour molten metal down his throat or to pinch off his nose with their hot tongues all in joke you know for they are very good-natured little dwarfs after all with their big heads and funny short crooked legs at which they laugh themselves quite as much as they laugh at anybody else oh they are merry mischievous little fellows these gnomes of the northern mountains and they watch year by year the beautiful metals and the glittering crystals as they grow deep down in the caverns of the rocks and they dig them out and make jewels and drinking cups of them for the king of the gnomes who lives in the middle of a mountain near the north pole and sometimes they make channels in the mountains and pour metal into them and then if any men find it they dig it out and are very glad they have discovered it and one learned man says it was made so and so and another learned man contradicts him and says no these rocks and metals have been made so and so and they get angry and quarrel about it and all the time the little gnomes laugh and chuckle and say listen to these mortals who think themselves so wise what nonsense they talk and how they quarrel and contradict each other 
sometimes when they are in a very good humour they will take a pocket full of precious stones and pour them into a stream or put them in a hole for some poor man to find and sell to buy food for his little children oh they are not bad fellows the little crooked-legged gnomes another fairyland is the fairyland of the greedy children where the houses are built of sugar candy and the walls are of hard bake and butterscotch and the trees are all of barley sugar and the streams are ginger beer and cowslip wine and the snow turns to whipped cream and the rain to new milk but that fairyland is very near the country of physic cum headache a very ugly place indeed where the sand is gregory's powder and the lakes are filled with black draught and smell worse than the thames or the cam at cambridge or the fountains in kensington gardens note written before the improvements and last of all there is the country of all round about us the most lovely of all the fairy lands only so many people who live there are blind and never see any of the beautiful things that surround them or hear the sweet sounds that are for ever murmuring round them for the winds make aeolian harps of the trees and play oh such pleasant music on them and the mountain streams do the same with the rocks they run over and the flowers talk to each other especially in an evening just before they go to sleep in the twilight the little blue forget-me-nots on the edges of the still calm lakes sing songs to the beautiful water-lilies as they float near them and the words are about those who used to love them perhaps most of all for their sweet name and when the oldest the pink ones have sung a verse all the young blue ones then join in a chorus and sing forget me not forget me not and the water lilies say no we will not forget you for you tell us of those who have passed away to the land of all blessedness those who always understand the music of the fairyland in which they dwelt while here and so they all talk about the things they like the best and that they think the most about and some are very merry and sing such funny songs but it is only the very good-tempered and happy children who can hear them the red poppies throw their scarlet caps at the blue cornflowers when the harvest moon is shining bright and clear and say come you little blue jokers practise the harvest home song and let us have a night of it and then they get so noisy and play each other such jokes that the grave ripe corn especially the barley which ought to be serious you know for it is bearded like a patriarch can scarcely get any sleep and then the trees and flowers and waters in the land of all round about us are so clever they always tell the tales and sing the songs that suit the people best who can hear them i told you many people never can hear them not in all their life and will not believe that any one hears them i wonder if you will hear their pleasant talk i hope so for it is a great pleasure well i was saying they are so clever in always talking at the right time and about the right things they never tell sad stories to happy little boys and girls nor joking ones to those who are in sorrow they speak gently oh so gently and sadly to those whose dear ones have gone away and who will see them no more till after many tears have been wept nor do they tell laughing tales to those who are studying the nature of wonderful plants and rocks and to some they sing grand hymns about the beginning of things and to some they tell the story of the past of the long ages gone of that far-off time when monstrous creatures alone lived on this earth and men there were none but i was going to tell you about the little prince be petted by all and instead of that i have been telling you about fairy lands so now i will begin again and tell you about him well i think it must have been in the land of all round about us that he lived he had a great many people to take care of him as a little prince be petted by all was sure to have and better far than most little princes he had a great many people who loved him 
there were the three head governants the first of whom was the lady cecilia who saw that he was properly clothed and fed he was never allowed to go into the land of greedy children to chip bits off the rocks of hardbake and break the branches of the sugar candy trees because if he had a creature all covered with black cloth who drove about in a sort of chariot would have carried him away to the land of physic come headache and perhaps have kept him there for several days or even it might be weeks for it is often very hard indeed to get away from that ugly country she had also to watch lest the ice king or the frost giant should touch him and pinch his hands and feet till they were stiff and red which they will do if they can catch little children out of doors at christmas without their warm gaiters and mittens on and if the north wind or his worst brother the east wind came hallooing by frightening all the poor little spring flowers that had just peeped out of the ground to look at the sun and say good day little pipetti by all lady cecilia would say you must ride on your rocking horse to-day and i will tell you stories but you must not go out to fight with the north wind why he has just come back from freezing the sea for the ice king at the north pole and getting his fleet of icebergs ready for him to sail down and crush the whale ships once they nearly crushed to pieces the ship in which one of your uncles was going to a country a long way from here so we do not like the ice king's fleet though they are beautiful to look at then there was the lady bien aimé who taught him what things he might play with and what things he was not to touch and soon he learnt to know that he was not to take the king his father's books off the shelves in the library and build houses of them as he did with his wooden bricks and she taught him too not to begin to scream when he saw the sous gouvernante manenetta descend the staircase to conduct him to his own apartments the lady rosina's principal duty was to play and sing to him when he was too tired to care for his toys he had a wonderful animal on which he rode when the weather was fine it had four legs and a long tail to switch off the flies and soft short grey hair and a brown mark across its shoulders and rather long ears i am obliged to say that it had not a pleasant voice but be petted by all was very fond of it though sometimes i am sorry to say if he had a cane in his hand for he did not always carry a sceptre about with him as little princes do in the fairy lands of the dear old books no he only carried a cane and sometimes he struck aswoolly that was the animal's name a sharp blow on its head that made it put its rather long ears down and start off quite suddenly so fast that prince be petted by all would fall upon its neck and have to clutch at the housings that covered it lest he should come tumbling down upon the ground and you may imagine what a fright he looked doubled up on aswoolly's back like a bundle made of a pillow and a hat and a jacket and a pair of boots then lady bianeme would say to him you are justly punished for being so unkind and i hope whenever you are cruel as you were just now that aswoolly will treat you in the same way but i think he was not often unkind to anything or the beautiful little creature with wings that lived in the grove near the palace would not have come to him yet it did so and whenever he came near its home it would spread out its pretty wings and come to look at him and speak to him its voice was very sweet but he could not understand what it said because it belonged to another world not to his world of which he had not yet learned the language but he liked its pleasant voice sometimes he was taken for a short time to stay in the city of the world an immense city and containing more wonderful things than were to be found in the cities of the arabian nights i think even sinbad who had seen so many strange places would have been astonished if he had been taken by some jinn and put down in the middle of the city of the world and would have exclaimed by allah this is wonderful 
the noise of this multitude of people is like the sound made by the army of the king of the jinns as they pass over the desert but the soft low voices of the land of all round about us are almost lost in the great sounds of that mighty city and i think the little prince when he was very young liked better to be in his own fairyland amongst the trees and flowers that he understood I think this is all I can tell at present about Prince Bipetid by all. He is now growing so tall that I fear he will soon have to leave his own pleasant land. And if he does, I hope he will go and live in the country that many of his relations inhabit, which is a very beautiful land too, and where he can listen to the stories that the rocks and the forests tell. End of part three Part four of Cecil's Own Book by Anne Hawkshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Noontide Dream. A little child sat on the grass, and as he watched the shadows pass from the clouds above his head, softly to himself he said, I do not like the shadows flitting, or the place where I am sitting chasing the sunbeams up the hill and making all so sad and chill what were clouds made for i wonder are they meant to hold the thunder or palaces the rain king makes and the angry north wind breaks when the ice king sends him forth from his snowlands in the north where the walrus has its home and the savage white bears roam softly to himself thus talking while the shadows danced and played sleep came o'er him gently stealing on the time his head was laid and a thousand fairy faces that were ever changing places dancing here and resting there flitted round him whispering wonders that they saw on land and sea where niagara foams and thunders thus they say at home are we on the crest of ocean billows on the dancing stream where willows in the summer noontide quiver on the dewdrops of the morning that the gossamer hath strung when the autumn day is dawning we can dance but if our king far away the clouds will fling for we vanish one and all when cloud shadows o'er us fall all the flowers our empire own pale and colourless and weak they will tell you they must be without us could you hear them speak listen mortal child and try to hear the voices passing by voices that for ever sound all this wondrous world around then he saw them hand in hand on the bank beside him stand one was clothed in robe of blue another had the roses hue and for ever mixing blending each to each her colours lending till at last they all were blent in one dazzling element and they smiling sped away and a warm and sunny ray woke the child from out his sleep that had been so soft and deep the squirrel that forgot that it would be winter a story of hollycombe in eighteen sixty six there was a little squirrel once lived in a tulip tree as merry a little fellow as ever you did see his tail was long and bushy his fur was thick and soft and he had a nest within a hole in the branches up aloft all summer he had played about and never food had wanted though he did not meddle with the trees that grandpapa had planted he did not nibble off the shoots of dolly's cedar tree or nor the wellingtonia that dear cecil's is to be but he cracked the nice sweet beech nuts and scampered o'er the grass and gathered up the acorns brown but then alas alas he quite forgot that summer days and autumn nuts don't last and quite forgot how he must live when the pleasant time was past november days were short and chill but yet upon the ground an acorn or a chestnut by searching well he found 
but after that december came and the wind sighed wild and drear he listened but no robin's song could little frisky hear nought but the sighing of the wind the leafless branches threw or the whirring of the pheasant cock as past his hole it flew then christmas came and white and thick the snow lay on the ground and not an acorn or a nut could anywhere be found he tried to sleep but in the morn a faint and sickly ray of sunshine crept into his hole and told him it was day so down the tree he slowly came and crept along the snow and o'er the lawn and o'er the fence to where the beech trees grow beside the croquet ground for there his cousin flosky dwelt and very humbly on the snow poor little frisky knelt i am very hungry cousin floss and you have such a store of nuts and acorns in your hole do let me have a score i'll pay them back next year dear coz i will indeed and try not to forget in summer days how quickly they go by when flosky heard his cousin call he never said a word pretending to be fast asleep and that he nothing heard he crept down farther in his hole among the nice warm hay and thought i will not make a noise and then he'll go away poor frisky listened but in vain he pricked up both his ears his heart grew very sad indeed his eyes were full of tears he wiped them with his furry tail and then he said i'll try to find a bit of twig to eat none can me that deny so slowly o'er the fence he crept and o'er the lawn again he was so hungry and so cold to walk was quite a pain but frisky when he reached his home screamed out in pure delight and clapped his little paws and danced quite frantic with delight for bridger with his broom had swept a place quite clean and bare and grandpapa had put a heap of maize and barley there he ate a little barley first and then he tried the maize oh dear he said i have not had such food for many days then up into his hole he took a store to last till spring when well he knew the buds would burst and the little birds would sing and the sunshine on the soft green leaves would play and rest by turn and noiselessly unfolding too would grow the lady fern how good he said it was to put that nice sweet food for me i'll never nibble off a shoot again of any tree the ambitious water lily once embosomed by high mountains on which giant pine trees grew lay a lovely quiet lakelet with its waters of deep blue waterfowl from many countries built their nests upon its shore for by man twas unfrequented nor disturbed by dipping oar on one side high crags enclosed it that the ivies clothed with green and in every nook and crevice tufts of feathery fern were seen stones that centuries had rounded were upon the other hand and like gold dust in the sunshine glittered the low banks of sand there the brambles shining berries and its graceful leaves were spread while the hardy mountain ashes waved their branches overhead but though mortal never crossed it oft was seen a fairy boat by the wild birds in the twilight o'er its stilly waves to float in it stood a tiny lady not more beautiful than she were the daughters of the genie or the peris of the sea shining glistening in the sunset gleaming pale when moonlight fell skimmed her pearly vessel onward fashioned like an ocean shell all things knew her all things loved her birds and wild flowers of the glen all like her that lived with nature far away from haunts of men in the shallows of the lakelet was the water-lily's home there for years had she been floating 
and had never wished to roam but one day she drooped in sorrow closed her flowers and sighing said wasted life to dwell for ever on this lake's unnoticed bed lily of these lovely waters art thou weary of thy lot that all other flowers have envied said the meek forget-me-not ah thou knowst not simple floweret said the water lily then that my kinsfolk live in splendour where are found the haunts of men one wears a crown imperial one is royal the proud fleur de lis a sultan's cap another boasts and i am what alas for me i am but nymphia alba only the white maiden of the lake and what sweeter dearer title could men give or couldst thou take but who told thee of thy kindred and about the homes of men i have come all down the burnside from the source above the glen and i have never heard these histories then the lily waved with pride and turned scornfully and proudly from the pale flower at her side what shouldst thou know of the great world who would care to tell to thee of the lands o'er which they wander or the wondrous things they see when the wild geese came last season to encamp beside our lake one of them came swimming near me first he bowed and then he spake princess yes he called me princess what a dreary lot is thine i should pine away and perish in a month if it were mine then he told me of the countries where my noble kinsfolk dwell in the garden of the rose queen for she loves them passing well and he said that i was fairer than the fairest of them all lovelier than the royal lily though perhaps not quite so tall so it was the wild goose told thee of the countries far away if they are so grand and glorious had he not there better stay do not listen to his gossip babbler he hath ever been then she paused see down the waters comes our lovely fairy queen it is well the lily answered i will ask of her a boon and if granted in the great world oh what joy i shall be soon when the queen heard her petition mournfully she turned away sighing said thy boon oh lily shall be granted in a day the next morning down the mountains ere the flowers were half awake came a man the first that ever had approached that lovely lake eagerly he seized the lily then for miles and miles he sped till at last he smiling placed it in a garden fountain's bed dark and muddy was the water thick and sooty was the air for the smoky giant city blighted all of beauty there one by one the lily's petals browned and withered ere they spread and its leaves discoloured shrivelled sank within their muddy bed and the owner of the garden seized and flung it o'er the wall and amid a bed of nettles did the water lily fall there it very soon had perished but a little boy i think it might be cecil saw and took it to a pretty brooklet's brink and there threw it in the water where it grew but never more did it bloom in snowy beauty as beside the still lake's shore end of part four